All right, this is our last class in synthesis. We're finishing up the book of Song of Solomon today. And uh, I need to go over, back up, go over a few things that I gave to you last class, uh, talking about uh, the authorship and the uh, title of the book and things like that. Um, having gone through uh, the uh, classic Old Testament commentary, written by Kyle and Delish back in the 1800s on, uh, on, on the complete Old Testament. Uh, this is a very illuminating remarks on some of these things, so I want to add to it. Um, one, one or two comments on the title of the book. We already observed from Jensen that uh, Song of Songs is the Hebrew way of expressing the superlative. And... Uh, Gave you the Latin and the Greek titles. Um, Delish has a, a better way of approaching it. He goes to the first verse and he says the Song of Solomon's, which are the Song of Songs, which are Solomon's, says that the, this title itself shows two things. First of all, the shows that it's a complete or connected work. Um, it's not. Uh, a series of uh, unrelated acts or or scenes that that it does have a complete theme. And secondly, it's the work of one author um, because it's related to Solomon. Uh, he points out this uh, by the phraseology used here. It cannot mean two things. First, it can't mean that it's composed of a number of songs. That is, a song of songs. Right? Although you might get that from the English, the song of songs, right? like a book of pages, so to say. Right? He says that it doesn't mean that. The Hebrew expression just doesn't allow that. And secondly, you can't interpret it as one of Solomon's songs because there's a better, there's a better way grammatically to express that it was uh, that it belonged to Solomon. The proper explanation of the title, he says, is found in the Jewish Midrash. I'll give you a quotation here. Uh, it, it describes this book as, quote, the most praiseworthy, most excellent, most highly treasured among the songs. As you would, you and I would refer to a servant of servants. It's just, it's the superlative. <clears throat> Regarding the authorship of the book, he has a few helpful comments as well. Um, he definitely believes that the book was written by Solomon. Uh, he gives uh, several arguments. Um, the author's familiarity with nature the fullness and extent of the book's geographical and artistic references, the mention of so many exotic plants and foreign things, particularly of such objects of luxury as Egyptian horses. Um, like Psalm 72, this book has many images taken from plants. Like the book of Job, it has dramatic form. Like the book of Proverbs, it has many allusions to the book to Genesis. And he concludes that if it was not Solomon who wrote this book, then at least it had to have been near his time because other books reveal an acquaintance with the psalm. For example, he says the first nine chapters of Proverbs um, show some familiarity with his book. He doesn't elaborate, so I can't tell exactly what he meant by that. Uh, he says the introduction to the older book of Proverbs has to be placed about 909 to 882 BC. And the author's uh, supplement in Proverbs 22 to 24, because all of those three passages um, show an acquaintance with this book. Even um, people that don't believe that Solomon wrote the book um, 
state that uh, this book was written in one of the most flourishing uh, time periods of the Jewish language and culture. And they ascribe it to um, to a poet of the northern kingdom about 950 BC, which is named time of Solomon. He discusses some of the critics' views. He says uh, German higher critics and modern Jewish criticism place it in the Greek age, kind of Greek, so in the Intertestament period. And he says uh, that the poet was acquainted with the ideals of Theocritus and the Greek erotic poets placed the ideal picture of pure Jewish love over against the immorality of Alexandrian court and its Hellenistic partisans, all on the basis of Greek, the Greek re-sizing of the language and Greek customs and symbols in the book. His answer to that is that even just because there's similarity of language uh, proves nothing because when you have similarity of subject matter, the bounty is the same terminology. This doesn't prove that the Song of, Sol Song of Solomon followed the Greek's writings, Rather, it's quite probable, he says, just like Unger argues, you know, that you just turn it around and it just means that the Greek, they could have used this, you know. He doesn't prove anything. Now, he gives a couple of insights on Jewish tradition that I hadn't read anywhere else. He said that uh, Bathra 14b and 15a, a Jewish source, ascribed the inclusion of Isaiah, Proverbs, Song of Solomon, and Ecclesiastes in the canon by the by the Hezekiah Collegium. Therefore, the book has to be dated back in the period before the rise of the Great Synagogue. Okay. Josephus, who lived 100 AD, alluded to the to four books of hymnal ethical, ethical character, that is, uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song, as in the Alexandrian canon, a fact which he obviously understood as a very ancient thing. So, it had been around for a long time, according to Josephus. And, uh, so, just a couple of added things there. Moving on to the relationship of the book to the rest of Scripture. I think we already touched on this, but just a couple of added comments. Delish makes a comparison of the um, Song of Solomon to the other books of the the writings. Song of Solomon was written on the eighth day of Passover. Did I say written? Read. It was read on the eighth day of Passover. Both, huh? The last one, the last one, the I guess so. Ruth was written on the second Shabbat, that is on Pentecost. Right? Yeah. Lamentations was read on the night of Av. Ecclesiastes was writ, read on the third of Sukkah, and it's a piece of tabernacle. Esther was read between the 11th and the 16th of Adar at the Feast of Purim. Purim. And then, as I pointed out a few moments ago, he compares it to uh, Psalms, Job, and Proverbs. Compared to Psalm 72, this book has many images taken from plants. 
As in Job, the book has dramatic form, the drama. As in Proverbs, it has many allusions back to the creation. Now, under notes of, of interest, and lessons of special importance, uh, in his introduction, he had a lot of very important uh, comments to make, and so I'm going to elaborate quite a bit on that this morning. One quotation that I thought was worth writing down, he said uh, in his very first line was that the song is the most obscure book of the Old Testament. The song is the most obscure book of the Old Testament. We've already pointed out from Jensen's comments that there are three basic interpretations of the book. There's a naturalistic interpretation, allegorical, and typical. Now, to get a little more specific on that, Delish discusses these things. And uh, just want to comment on that. The, the first century interpretation of the Jews was allegorical. And there's all kinds of them. He says, um, there's a few, few examples of allegorical interpretation, but the Targum paraphrases this book as a picture of the history of Israel from the Exodus to the coming of Messiah. The history of Israel from Exodus to the, to the coming of Messiah. That's one interpretation. A very different allegorical understanding of the book makes the bride Israel and her breasts two attributes of Messiah his lowliness and glory <laughs> that's uh, different you understand why allegorical interpretation is a very uh, trustworthy Loneliness and glory. And in that particular understanding, Solomon is, is a representation of Jehovah himself. Um, It's because of the allegorical interpretation that it is read on the eighth day of, uh, of Passover. Because it leads, it goes from the Exodus to the coming of Messiah, and the Passover is obviously going back to the Exodus, so that's why they read it then. It's the historical interpretation. Um, the Christians have also allegorized this book. Fantastic figure here. This is probably even worth writing down, but Oregon produced 12 books on, the, on this book. Oregon, 12 books. Uh, Bernard de Clairvaux preached 86 sermons and he only got down to chapter 2 before he died. His disciple preached another 48 sermons and only got to the 10th verse of the 3rd chapter. There was a, an Italian musician produced 29 songs in 1584 on this book. Per Luigi di Palestrina. <laughs> kind of interesting. Be good for uh, Bible trivia. But anyway, the Christians have, have uh, allegorized this book as well, making it the mutual love of Christ and his church. Um, Again, there are 
a variety of um, specific uh, interpretations, all under the heading of Christian allegorizing. Um, for example, Shulami is uh, taken as a personification of Israel and also of the church. Uh, one German theologian made uh, the beloved the ten tribes of the north longing for reunification with David with the south. That's a Christian allegory. Okay. Um, another interpretation makes Shulamith the pers personification of wisdom. Personification of wisdom. Just an ode to a uh, non physical thing that is given. Something like that. Right? But see, those are all three drastically different viewpoints. And then a fourth one, um, he says, uh, makes Shulamith equal to the church. Okay. Now he, he asks, um, He asks questions about all of these views. He says, if Shulamith is the church, who are the 60 queens and 80 concubines? Um, and yet he acknowledges that in the book of Ephesians you have this parallel. You know, the husband-wife relationship is, is actually a mystery that does describe Christ's relationship to his church. So he says there's seems to be some support for some of these views, but how far do you go? Now his view isn't he, he disagrees with the allegorical view. His view is the typical interpretation, which uh, Jensen pointed out. And apparently from reading his book, uh, he, he produced a commentary uh, years before he before this commentary. And it was a new thing, a new concept that, uh, that no one agreed with, almost nobody in Europe. When it first came out, the Alpha use of the lunch. But anyway, the, tr the traditional view is uh, probably, not the traditional, the typical view is probably the best interpretation. In this view, Shulamith, he, he considers her to have been a historical person, not Pharaoh's daughter, but a country maiden of humble, lowly rank, beautiful, pure in soul, who drew Solomon out of polygamy. But he had already had 60 in his court, he already had 60 women at this time, and he takes that as indicating the book was probably written fairly early in his reign, just when he was beginning to fall, and that he came across this, this woman that really taught him something. Yeah. He says that uh, accordingly, if you read the book this way, as if it was a real person, the book is really a protest against polygamy. She, the woman that falls in love with Solomon, and Solomon falls in love with her, and and uh, and then when he leaves her after a period of being married, uh, and goes back to his harem, um, uh, she goes looking for him and finds him, and uh, he didn't. I don't think he he says that he actually went back to his harem, but he left her, uh, and she she goes looking for him and finds him in the garden. And uh, brings him back, and um, yeah. I'll see if I can find a quotation for it. It's, it's really good. Um, he says the song is really a historical, ethical, and typical mystical uh, has typical mystical meaning. The typical interpretation proceeds in the idea that the type and antitype do not exactly coincide. That's kind of an important point. I was thinking about what what is a type? What are the parameters of a type? Uh, when we say the ark is a type of Christ, what do we mean by that? Do we mean that the ark parallels the person and work of Christ in every respect or in many respects? And if so, how many? Where do you draw the line? Okay. And so he points that out. He says, 
the typical interpretation proceeds on the idea that type and antitype do not exactly coincide. The mystical stamps itself in the earthly, but at the same time is immeasurably different from it. There's um, another, there is more than one typical interpretation of the book. One is, is that, um, of his view, is that the book, uh, Shulamith is the church, and even though she's a historical person, she, she represents the church, and Solomon is her beloved, he represents Christ, because a greater than Solomon is here, Jesus, said. Jesus himself parallel parallel himself to Solomon. And the other typical interpretation makes uh, Shulamith still the church, but there's supposed to have been a shepherd. Her really, her only true love, somebody that she knew from her homeland, that uh, um, And that King Solomon came and uh, forced her to leave her home and come to his harem. This is Solomon's pictured in a very different view that the true love is really the shepherd. So the shepherd hypothesis is something he doesn't agree with. Um, As far as the geography of the book, before we leave that, uh, before the notes of interest, he, uh, one very important observation he said, in the first half of the book, in uh, the first three acts, you have Shulami rising to an equality with Solomon. He raises her up on a level with him, and Shulami ends up uh, being at home in the king's palace. In the first three acts. Uh, she ends up uh, being raised up to an equal position with Solomon in the king's palace. And the second half of the pictures, uh, in the last three acts, Solomon descends to an equality with Shulami. when he ends up at her home in Galilee. He ends up at her home in Galilee. That kind of uh, is a neat picture of it. Talking about the distinction between the type and the antitype, um, in, in the book of Songs, Delish pointed out, I'm not going to be able to find that quote because it's got 100 pages there, but I remember reading it yesterday. He said that in the type, Solomon is. Uh, The bride is the one that's considered purer than her husband, because her husband leaves her and isn't faithful. Like you know, he deserts her after a period of time, and she goes looking for him and finds him. Whereas in the antitype, it's the other way around. That uh, Christ is, is perfect, you know, and purer than Solomon and the Church. We're the ones that leave Christ. So there's that's 
one of the strongest contrasts between the type and types and anti-types that you see. As far as geography in the book, in the first act, and, and the reference, I'll give you the references when we get to the outline of the book. In the first act, we have Solomon and uh, the Shulamite in the dining room. And in the wine room, that appertained to the women in the royal palace. We get that from uh, verse 2 and 3. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. Verse 4, the king hath brought me into his chambers. So forth. Okay. In Act 2, we are at uh, the Shulamite's home. The beams of our house are cedar, and our rafters are fir. I am the rose of Sharon, and the lily of the valley. As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my love under the sun. Right? Talks about her home, Sharon. Sharon is up north in Galilee. Okay. Um, Act 3, the bride enters Jerusalem from the wilderness and is at the marriage festival in Jerusalem. Act 4 takes place in Jerusalem. Act 5 takes place in a place called the Park of Etam. Uh, entering Jerusalem from the wilderness. Uh, Act 5 takes place in a place called the Park of Etam where Solomon had a country house. And the last act pictures the newly married couple on the way to Shulam in the bride's parental home. Okay, I'm looking at some outlines of the book. Um, uh, on the analytical level, Schofield gives us uh, a very analytical but somewhat unhelpful outline. Okay, you might as well make the observation. The title is in the first verse, one one, and then he divides the book into thirteen canticles or songs, specific. I'll give it to you. The first one is in one, one, uh, one, two through six. Second canticle in one, seven through eight. The third canticle is one, nine through seventeen. Fourth is two, one to seven. Are you having a hard time reading this easy? <laughs> the fifth is uh, 2, 8 to 17. The sixth is 3, 1 to 5. The seventh is 3, 6 to 11. The eighth is 4, 1 to 7. The 
tonight is 4 8 to 5 1. Tenth canticle is 5 2 to 6 3. Number 11 is 6 4 to 7 10. Number 12 is 7 11 to 8 4. Six four to eleven ten. Seven ten. Number twelve is seven eleven to eight four. And chapter the last one is eight five to fourteen. That's an analytical, right? Just simply divides it into the various songs that were, were spoken without any reference to try to interpret it where it's coming from. Now, if you read through, if you have a Schofield edition. They give you the narratives in, in italics, right, at the heading of each one of these canticles to tell the story. Uh, Jensen's outline to the uh, book is three part: the title in one one, and then from one two to five one, you have love at first expressed and experienced. Love first expressed and experienced. You have courtship days in uh, 1, 2 to 3, 5. No, 1, 2 to 3, 5. Yeah, breaking it down in two parts. You have the courtship days and the wedding, 3, 6 to 5, 1. And then the last major division in the book is 5 2 through 8 14. Love tried and triumphant. That's referring to married life. Yeah, married life. Let's try Unger's four part outline. One one to three five. The bride muses in the bridegroom's palace. The bride muses or reflects, thinks, in the bridegroom's palace. Three six to five one. The bride accepts the bridegroom's invitation. Five two to six three. The bride dreams of separation from the bridegroom. And lastly, in six four to eight fourteen, the bride and the bridegroom. Express ardent love for each other. Now here's Common Delicious outline. I've already mentioned the six six acts in the book, uh, according to him. The title of the book in one one. The first act concerns the mutual affection of the lovers. The mutual affection of the lovers. One two to two seven. In two eight to three five. The second act. 
the mutual seeking and finding of the lovers. And the third act in three six to five one, the home bringing of the bride and the marriage. The fourth act in five two to six nine Love disdained but one again. Love disdained but one again. The fifth act, which runs from 610 to 84, describes Shulami, attractively fair but humble princess. Shulami, the attractively fair but humble princess. And the last act in eight five to fourteen. Ratification of the covenant of love. In Shulamit's native home. Uh, Kyle, or uh, rather Delish, points out that each of those six acts uh, naturally breaks into two scenes, each of them. So actually he's, he would say that the book divides into twelve scenes. Now, I'm not very happy with that because uh, We haven't actually gone through the book, but I don't think we're going to take the time to do that. So that's it for Synthesis 112. Um, because we have four more classes before the end of the year, I'm going to try to take that time and get caught up in, the, in all the marking I've got to do. and. Um, Taking up notes. I need that time. So that's what I will try to get done. Get all that stuff in your hands. And as far as the final exam goes, uh, for the people that write the exam, it will cover the last six weeks. And uh, whatever was on the six and the twelve weeks exam in this semester could. The final exam will be composed of stuff off the six, twelve weeks of that, plus new material in the last six weeks. That's pretty standard, so it is. So, you need to get into my hands, assignments, and other outstanding.